away, of course, from home. So what was the board of aldermen to do to guard against the possibility of a German threat? Well, I'm very glad to say, in April of 1917, that they acted forthrightly, they were up to the emergency, and what they did was they bought two of those guns over there, uh, Gatling guns, as they called them, that's actually a French manufacturer, but close enough. And not only did they have Gatling guns, but they also enlisted the football team of Tufts to actually form a special police force in case something should go wrong in the event of a German attack. And they enrolled men 35 and years over in what turned out to be four companies of a home guard so that the uh, mayor of Somerville, a guy named Eldridge at the time, could truthfully say that the approach of an invading army would find Somerville reasonably prepared to meet the emergency. So if the German army were to march up, uh, for example, Broadway, they see that thing and they take a quick right turn into Medford. Uh, so everything was going to be okay. Uh, because of the uh, entry into the war in 1917, all automobiles in Somerville were specially registered so that they could be commandeered in case of emergency. And city employees were actually sent out to have personal conversations with anyone in the city of Somerville born in Germany to make sure that they were loyal, a harbinger of things to come. And they actually found one woman who was living on uh, Hancock Street near Porter Square. Her name was actually Pabst as a matter of fact, uh, and they were a bit worried about her because she had two brothers in the German army. So they went to talk to her, what's your story? And she said, I haven't heard from them since 1915, uh, rather ominously, and they decided to let her go, despite the fact that she was from Germany and had two brothers in the German army, because as it turned out, she also had a husband who was the lead trombone player on the USS Nebraska. So they figured that she was probably okay. But as that first spring of the war went on, Somerville residents fell over themselves to display their support for the war effort. The businessmen of Union Square, as you see in the flyer for tonight, put together a huge flag, 20 feet by 30 feet, to be hung across Somerville Avenue. 10,000 people watched that flag as it went up in April of 1917, including 150 employees of the Union Glass Company in Union Square who had donated their own huge flag to be draped in front of the factory. And not to be outdone, the businessmen of Davis Square promptly raised their own huge flag across Holland Street, which was just as big, they were quick to point out, as the businessman's flag in Union Square. And Next slide. Uh, all the athletic fields at Tufts University in 1917 were divided into 62 garden plots to support the war effort by making what food might be necessary uh, for those who would cultivate those fields. In, in the library area, the park around City Hall, those became garden plots too. So the usual tulips and geraniums that were there were now replaced by potatoes, tilled and planted by over 500 Somerville Public School students and their teachers. Land along the railroad tracks between Lowell and Cedar Street were planted with vegetables, and over a thousand people signed up to receive free seeds from the city to plant their own gardens, believing in the motto, the planting line supports the firing line. And of course, the point to all those gardens was to support the war effort by freeing up food production as much as possible for the troops who would, have, who would eventually be going to France. In fact, in 1918, the United States government bought 45% of the entire tomato crop of the United States, and they were going to buy an awful lot of grain as well. So gone were the flowers that had once been cultivated along the ways of Highland Avenue, and now the vegetables were there uh, instead. And speaking of money, during the first Liberty Loan bond sale in Somerville, every house in Somerville was visited by 200 official city representatives fanning out around the city. Not all 201 house, of course. They're all fanning around the city, uh, and they wanted to try to sell those war bonds. And one in six residents of the city of Somerville bought a war bond. Many of those who did not buy war bonds from the people who were selling them in Somerville had bought them down in Boston, so they were okay. And among those who bought the war bonds were 93 students at Somerville High School. And if you didn't buy a war bond, what they would do is no, everybody would know about that, because if you did buy a war bond, there was a sign saying, we have subscribed in the window subtle pressure to buy that war bond. So when everybody was talking about the war, everybody was thinking about the war, the number one enemy, of course, was the Germans, but the second topic of conversation that everybody was talking about, and the number two enemy, was the tea. 
or at least, I should say, the predecessor of the T, the Boston Elevated Railroad Company, because that very spring of 1917, the Boston Elevated Railroad Company decided to stop sending cars up Somerville Avenue to Spring Hill, even though there were tracks there for a long time. And the residents of Summer Street couldn't believe it. They bought their houses, many of them, on the expectation that housing values would go up because the trolley was going up and down Summer Street. And now they were told no more without any warning, which meant if you lived on Summer Street, now you had to walk up to Highland Avenue to catch the trolley. And even that was a problem. Everybody was complaining about this because all the cars going up Highland Avenue, which had always started at uh, Park Street, now all of a sudden we're going to start at Scully Square. And the Boston Elevated Railroad Company didn't bother announcing that from now on we're going to start the cars at Scully Square government center that is in not Park Street so everybody standing around Scully Square uh, were fine but everybody standing around Park Street waiting for the train waited for hours where's the train where's the train nobody told them and then they finally went to Scully Square and figured it out and those who went on the early trains up Highland Avenue the day they began this had their own rude awakening because the Boston Elevator Railroad cars going up Highland Avenue without any announcement at all were now going express so, if you lived on Walnut Street, now you had to get off at Lowell Street, and you had a nice little walk for yourself that you didn't know you were going to have, even though every time the train had to stop at a stoplight because there was a cross street, even though it was an express train, they could have opened the door, they didn't open the door, and so on, and so on, and so on. Everybody was complaining about it. But the third thing everybody was thinking about that spring of 1917 uh, was alcohol and the growing insistence that the war effort would have to mean a reduction in the consumption and production of alcohol. Now some boo is right. Feel free to boo at any moment. Now Somerville in 1917 was already a dry city. There were no saloons in Somerville. The only commercial use of alcohol in Somerville had to do with the old Pony Express. The Pony Express was a system where uh, liquor dis distributors from Medford and places like that would transport beer and wine and liquor through Somerville to Boston with a horse-drawn trucks. That was the Pony Express. And what would happen is Somerville residents would know where the Pony Express was going. They'd stop the truck and here and there they'd buy something off the truck. But no longer. Uh, the City Council, the Board of Aldermen met and they decided to stop the Pony Express. They would no longer license the Pony Express from north of Somerville through Somerville to Boston. And one of the aldermen said this, when we stop to consider that seven billion pounds of foodstuffs are consumed in one year for the manufacture of intoxicating liquor sufficient to equip an army of seven million men, how can we now justify supporting Pony Express licenses? In fact, in this atmosphere, planting flowers when you could be planting vegetables planting flowers when you could be planting beans and potatoes and things like that, and drinking alcohol were considered equally unpatriotic. Here's what one man said in a lecture at the library in Somerville. There is no difference between a woman growing nasturtiums and a man drinking beer. <laughs> Meanwhile, 7,000 people in Somerville, 7,000 young men registered for the draft, and by that's, and that's in a, a city of 70,000. It's 10% of the city registered for the draft. And by the end of 1917, many of them had begun to go to the training camps. So by uh, fall 1917, the winter of 1917-1918, many of them were in the training camps preparing to go to France, obviously, when the time came. And I rather feel sorry for the men of Somerville who were in the 301st Field Artillery in the 76th Infantry Division training at Fort Devens because the Board of Aldermen thought it would be a very nice idea to bring them for a big party in their hometown of Somerville because they've been training at Fort Devens for so long. The only problem was it was January 4th and there was a horrible, horrible cold wave in Somerville. So what happened was uh, the Board of Aldermen brought them to Fort Devens. They took the train all the way to Union Square from Fort Devens, got there at 6 p.m. on January 4th, and then, in below zero weather, they marched up Highland Avenue to the Armory, as you can see, where they demonstrated a bit of drill, followed by a dance that went on until 1 a.m., and then they marched back to Union Square for the 326 train, 326 a.m. train back to Fort Devens. 
and it must not have been easy for those guys because the roads were almost frozen over that first week in January. All over Somerville, it was so cold that not only were the roads coated with ice, but the pipes were freezing all over the city. And despite the record cold, there were days at a time when there was no coal to be had anywhere in the city. People were in danger of freezing to death that January of 1918. Desperately, the Board of Aldermen tried to get coal from the state to ration it out to those who were in danger of freezing to death. The businesses of Somerville were told, you must keep limited hours or close. The churches closed, the schools closed. And if you needed coal and you couldn't buy any, there was none to be had, you'd march up to City Hall, stand in line, and wait for a ration. Yeah. And one story is, as people waited in the line that bitter, cold January of 1918, one woman approached the clerk at the table. It was now her point in line. She stumbled up in crutches. She was obviously hurt to get her allotment. But when she got there, she turned around. She saw how many people were still in line, and she told the clerk, I thought about it. I will take no more coal as long as so many others are indeed, I have enough to get by for another day. Should thank her. So while Somerville was shivering at home, the war, of course, was in its fourth year in Europe. And now we go to the alcohol portion of the talk. All the warring powers had their own policies about alcohol. Now, as far as we were concerned, one thing would be clear, no alcohol at the training bases. No alcohol at all at the training camps on pain of a thousand dollar fine or a year in jail. None for the troops, none for the officers. And what is more, Congress insisted that alcohol not be sold within five miles of any training camp for the U.S. Army as the troops prepared to go to battle across the Atlantic. And what that meant, if you're going to prohibit beer, alcohol, wine sales, within five miles of any training camp, that meant, among other things, the end of Storyville, the legendary red light district of New Orleans that you see here, where Louis Armstrong played, King Oliver played, Sidney Bechet played, and where, for 25 cents, you could buy on the corner of Basin and Canal the latest edition of the Blue Book, a directory of all available prostitutes and their particular talents. No more Storyville would be closed. In fact, it was illegal under any circumstances, wherever you were, to serve alcohol to a man in uniform. So what some tavern owners did was they'd have a table right by the door, piled up with raincoats. So if you were in the army, you show up at the door, they'd give you a raincoat, you sit at the bar, and then they could serve you because they couldn't see your uniform. Now, if you were a drinker, you knew that once you got to the training camp, you probably weren't gonna get any beer or alcohol. So it was a real party on the trains on the way to the training camps. That was their last chance. They were like frat parties, the train trips to the training camps. And as a matter of fact, the railroads complained about this because the men were getting so drunk on the way to the training camps that they were destroying railroad property. Something had to be done. The railroads were very upset about this, but nobody was happier about this than the saloon keepers of Cumberland, Maryland, just across the line from West Virginia, because as everybody knew, West Virginia was a dry state. So as soon as the train got through West Virginia and stopped at the next stop, Cumberland, Maryland, the recruits would jump off, make a mad dash for the saloons to buy what they could, bringing back bottles and bottles of bottles back to the train, everything they would need for the rest of the way. So because of behavior like that, the army finally said, all right, enough is enough, and they began issuing these special tabs that soldiers in civilian dress would have to put on their lapel or whatever they were wearing so that anybody would know they were in the army, so you weren't supposed to sell them under any circumstances any alcohol. I'm not sure how well that worked. A little tab, it's not hard to conceal. But to his credit, General Pershing allowed soldiers, once they got to France, and as long as they were off duty to drink beer and wine. And the reason was he was really afraid of alienating the shop owners of France who were used to selling a lot of cheap wine, way cheaper than any American could imagine. And he didn't want to alienate them, so he allowed soldiers to buy wine and beer as long as they were off duty. And that is why one Somerville resident uh, wrote home, he was a soldier in France in 1918, that everything was okay, except he didn't really like the French beer but he had found a place that served something that was much better, tasting just like Houghton's Vienna, 
a wonderful lager beer sold in Jamaica Plain, uh, referring to something he desperately loved and desperately missed that first winter of the war for us. Now, one very good reason to drink if you could would be to take your mind off the food you got in the trenches. The typical meat ration, for example, was always called Corn Willie, named after the Kaiser's son, who was, manning, who was commanding the army across from the Americans in their sector of the line. Uh, and that Corn Willie, when you opened it up, greeted you with a thick layer of congealed fat on top. Nasty stuff. No wonder you kind of want a beer. And they also had a version of hardtack biscuit so hard that one soldier thought they should make fortifications out of it. But as far as what General Pershing was really worried about, it wasn't beer, it wasn't wine, it wasn't any kind of liquor. What Pershing was afraid of in France was VD. As long as you avoided VD as a soldier, you were probably be gonna be okay for General Pershing. So every doughboy in France lived in fear of the short arm inspection, as they called it. At any point, you have to drop your trousers. That's the short arm inspection. Uh, and hopefully you, you wouldn't have VD because your officers weren't gonna like that. But every country had their own different policy in regard to alcohol. Now, we'll begin with Russia. Russia, one of the fighting powers, of course, had begun mobilizing its army at the end of July 1914. And on the last day of the month, July 1914, they issued a fateful order banning the sale of vodka for the duration of the war. An order that would be in effect for the next 11 years. Now, Tsar Nicholas made that decision because there was a popular impression that drunkenness had harmed the Russian war effort during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905. But this order was disastrous for the Russians. The Russian government had a monopoly on vodka production and depended on it for 28% of its revenue, and now all that was gone at one stroke of the pen leading one member of the Russian Duma to say, never since the dawn of humanity has a country upon entering a war renounced its largest source of income. With that tax revenue gone, the Russian government had to rely more and more on the currency it simply printed up. It printed up three million ruble notes a day in 1914, but by 1917, it was printing 50 million ruble notes a day. Naturally, that's gonna be terrible inflation, and when it tried to put caps on the price of bread to ease that inflation in the cities, that only convinced peasants not to sell bread in the cities, leading to the bread riots of February 1917, which initiated the Russian Revolution, which toppled the Tsar himself. Nor did the order stop intoxication, since wine and beer were still legal in Russia. And if you couldn't afford wine and beer, you might use shoe polish or some sort of varnish to put together something nice and homemade for you. Or maybe, if worse came to worse, you would try some of the cocaine and heroin now coming into Russia from Central Asia. None of this boded well for the Russian war effort. Now in Britain, they did a smarter thing. They raised the tax on alcohol during the war. So for example, whiskey in 1916 cost five times what it did in 1914. And one reason they raised the tax was that Home Secretary David Lloyd George desperately wanted to limit alcohol consumption as long as the war went on, actually stating that strong drink was a more deadly foe than Germany. Now, on his urging, the British government limited hours pubs could serve alcohol to 12 to 2 p.m., and then 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. But even that was better than Australia, where they ordered that the pubs close at 6 leading to an abysmal custom called the five o'clock swill, where you leave work at five o'clock, run to the pub, and drink as much and as fast as you could until six. But getting back to England, they also made it illegal to buy someone a pint, at least in the Midlands, where many of the mills were, so any pint you bought had to be consumed by you. You couldn't buy a pint for somebody else. And finally, in areas close to sensitive ammunition factories, the British government actually took over hundreds of pubs and began serving a weaker beer there. A product that became known and disliked as government beer. Or sometimes Lloyd George's beer, prompting a famous song some of you have heard, one of the lines of which goes something like this. Lloyd George's beer, it is a dear. Oh, they say it is a terrible war. Oh Lord, but there never was a war like this before, but the worst thing that ever happened in this war is Lloyd George's beer. Lord George's beer. 
Uh, none of this had anything to do with the fighting men in France. Uh, they were allowed to have their usual rum ration, 80% alcohol by volume. That's the rum they were drinking, especially going over the top right before they did that. And their officers freely drank whiskey. Now, men who drank almost nothing before the war soon changed their tune once they got to the Western Front. Robert Graves, the author of I, Claudius, for example, was a teetotaler before the war, never touched a drop. But once he got there, he soon changed. He was drinking a bottle of whiskey a day by 1916. And among the Germans, the liquor of choice was not really beer, it was schnapps. The daily ration of schnapps in the trenches for the German army was 125 milliliters. Uh, as Arnold Spied said, without women, without ammunition, even without strong points, it is possible to fight a war, but not without schnapps. And Eric Maria Remarque, the uh, author of All Quiet on the Western Front, said, it is easier to understand the psychology of women than it is to understand the psychology of schnapps. Schnapps has soul. But this, of course, is a story of beer in America in World War I, and so let's turn to that. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the true hero of our discussion today. We think in the 16th century, in Patagonia, when the first Europeans began to scout down the South American coast, they took with them, when they left, unknowingly, yeast from this tree. That's a Patagonian beech tree. And the yeast that strayed upon their ships and would go back with them to Europe was none other than our hero, as you know, Saccomyces Eubionis. To be exact, a yeast unlike any yeast ever found in Europe. That yeast, that Patagonian yeast, was very accustomed to cold weather. It liked cold weather. And when it got to Europe, purely by accident, we think, it very nicely merged with the yeast existing in Europe. And that began to allow the brewers of Bavaria to start making their beer so it fermented at colder temperatures. The origin of the modern lager beer, with its light golden color and its faintly carbonated feel. Now, not everybody is, uh, accepts the idea that lager is the result of that yeast from Patagonia at that time. But one thing is certain, it was the Bavarians who became associated with lagers. And when Germans came to the United States, in great numbers, by the mid-19th century, they brought with them a taste for lagers that would soon wean Americans away, once and for all, from the ales they had been drinking for 200 years. And the Germans were delighted when they got here to find there was plenty of ice in America for their lager sellers, especially in the Midwest. Before long, the number of breweries in the U.S. tripled. And all of them, most of them at least, were turning out lager, especially if they were under German ownership. By the beginning of the Civil War, St. Louis alone had 40 breweries turning out 60,000 barrels of lager a year. Milwaukee was turning out 68,000 barrels of lager a year, as opposed to about 3,000 barrels of traditional ale. Lager, and why not? Lager was more refreshing, it was lighter, it was healthier, and so different from ale that the great lager breweries were able to persuade the United States government to tax them at a much lower rate than the tax levied on producers of ale in Porter. And the popularity of lager just rose and rose throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century, but what it did was it cemented in the public mind a lasting link between beer and all things German. And that, of course, was where the trouble was going to come in. Now consider the owners of the largest breweries in America. Number one for a while, Joseph Schlitz, born in Hesse-Darmstadt, and like so many others, a German who came to America in the wake of the failed revolutions of 1848. He was managing a brewery in Milwaukee by the age of 25, and he made his fortune selling hundreds of barrels of beer at a cut-rate price, sometimes free, to the people of Chicago in the wake of the Great Fire of 1871. And that's what earned Schlitz the nickname, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And it also earned Schlitz lasting popularity, as you might know, in Chicago. Although Kerry Nation said it was the beer that made Milwaukee infamous. 
And it also paved the way for Schlitz, uh, after cornering the Chicago market, to make great strides in the civic engagement in Milwaukee. Uh, before Schlitz died in a shipwreck, uh, he was able to establish the largest hotel in Milwaukee, the Schlitz Hotel, and near it, the most opulent, most wonderful beer garden in all of North America, the famous Schlitz Palm Garden on Wisconsin Avenue. And there was also Joseph Pabst of Saxony, also a 48er, always called Captain Pabst, because he had risen through the ranks to become captain of the Comet, a Great Lakes steamer by the time he was 21. He started to run his father-in-law's brewery, not just in Milwaukee, but also in the entire country as he distributed uh, what became Pabst Blue Ribbon everywhere any American lived. Now Pabst became the richest man in Wisconsin. And his Pabst Blue Ribbon, as you might know, never actually won a Blue Ribbon. The reason is Pabst Blue Ribbon, you see the word best there, uh, is Pabst's wife's family was the best family, and their beer was originally best beer, so all Pabst did was drink his own Blue Ribbon over that beer he called best. Pabst Blue Ribbon. But above all, of course, there was Adolphus Gussie Bush of St. Louis, by way of the Saar Valley in Germany, who had three mansions in the United States, some of which required 50 people just to take care of the gardens. He was one of the richest men in North America when he died in 1913, having spent a great deal of his time and money by then fighting the growing prohibition movement. Now, as you can see from that slide up there, it did not help Gussie Bush that a lot of his advertisement had featured Otto von Bismarck when he began to try to uphold the honor of German beer in German culture in the face of assaults on just those things at the beginning of, uh, uh, towards the uh, second decade of the 20th century. And his son, Gussie Jr., would have to carry on the fight. Now, Gussie Jr. did everything to save the Bush Brewery as the war began and as people began to feel turned off by German lager beer. Here in Somerville, for example, to give you a sense of the depth of this anti-German sentiment, somebody gave a lecture at the high school depicting the American Revolution not as a struggle against the British, they were now our allies after all, but rather against a German king. George III, after all, was the great grandson of a guy who spoke German as a native language. And that flag that was raised on Prospect Hill was not a blow against the British, but rather against the German royal family that ruled them. So Gussie's son, Gussie Jr., had his work cut out for him, but he knew he had to fight back against this conflation of beer in Germanness and disloyalty. Now, he did everything he could to persuade people that drinking Budweiser was not a disloyal act. He bought Liberty Bonds. He gave to the Red Cross. He began wearing an American flag button on his lapel. He got rid of the statues of Bismarck at the brewery that his father had put up. He did everything but call his beer America. <laughs> they think of that later. None of it worked. Sales of Budweiser went down by 30% in 1917. And that was bad enough, but in 1918, Gussie's mother, Gussie Sr.'s widow, came back from years in Germany to uh, be in America where her son and her family was. It took her three months to get from Europe to Key West, Florida, and when she got to Key West, just to make sure she wasn't carrying anything dangerous, they strip searched her, even though she was 75 years old. And she kept her in jail for days and days without letting her go. Her lawyer said it was a treatment unexcelled in brutality. A treatment never perpetrated on the poorest prostitute or female pickpocket. But what had happened to Lily Bush was only a symptom of what by 1918 had become a full-blown attack on the brewers. This conflation of lager in Germanness simply couldn't be overcome by the best of Gussie's merchandising tactics. And the effort against the brewers was led by groups like the Anti-Saloon League who had long advocated for prohibition and now saw their chance now saw a glittering opportunity to link their cause with patriotic needs to win the war. So at the end of 1917, the brewers were told they had to reduce alcohol by volume in their beers to 2.75%, and that the tax they had to pay was going to be doubled to $3 a barrel. No wonder, with sentiments like this, quote, the worst of all our German enemies, said one politician in Wisconsin, the most treacherous and the most menacing 
are Pabst, Schlitz, and Miller. No Germans in this war are conspiring against the happiness of the United States more than Pabst, Schlitz, and Miller. Right here in Somerville, during the summer of 1918, there was a big prohibition meeting at the YMCA on Highland Avenue, where the speaker charged that the fondest hope of the Brewers had always been a German-American alliance, that they were working for it now, and that this was their great goal. The Kaiser's greatest hope in America, he said, is that you will be traitors and drink beer. You will be traitors not to support prohibition. And indeed, even as the Prohibition Amendment was making its way through the state legislatures in 1918, Massachusetts, I'm sorry, voted to ratify in April of 1918. Boo! Boo. While Connecticut and Rhode Island refused to ratify. But even as that was happening, the U.S. Senate was conducting official hearings to investigate charges mostly invented by Wayne Wheeler in the Anti-Saloon League that the Brewers were financing pro-German propaganda in the U.S. The end was near. And one reason was that as long as soldiers at the training camps could not drink, the prohibitionists now had a brand new argument. It's not fair that they can't drink when everyone else can. So that same fall of 1918, with American troops fighting and dying in the terrible Moore's Argonne offensive across the Atlantic, President Wilson ordered the brewers to stop producing beer as of December 1st, 1918. A ban that went into effect even though the war ended in November. The Volstead Act was less than a year away. Gussie Bush, however, was determined to soldier on for he had another idea. An idea he had in 1916 and that he now put into practice. An idea to sell something that looked like beer, that tasted like beer, but that only one half of 1% alcohol by volume. A bright, lively, foamy, nutritious beverage that was nothing less than liquid food. A pure drink less dangerous than milk and beer. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Bebo. <laughs> which, as Bush's promotional material said, would say to many, a bethirsted traveler, not get on the water wagon, but rather get on the Bebo wagon. Seasoned taste testers could not tell it from Budweiser. And like everything good in this world, Gussie Bush Jr. said, it was said to be founded on romance. He said he got the idea for the name uh, from a barmaid that he kind of took a shine to. Now, at first, they made Bebo one half of 1% alcohol. At first, they made Bebo by arresting the fermentation process so that it would be close to non-alcoholic. And during the war, it actually sold pretty well. Unlike real beer, you could drink it on the base. And when Prohibition loomed near the end of the war, Bush thought this, this is going to keep us in business. This might be the brewery's salvation. Other brewers in the United States thought so too. And it wasn't long before Bebo was joined by others. Other breweries tried to out Bebo Bebo. Stroh's <laughs> sold Luxo. Schlitz sold Famo. Pabst sold Pablo. Not to mention the occasional Yip, Mana, Quiz, Singo, Hoppy, and of course, Gozo. Huh. Quote, a minimum of stimulant and a whole lot of nourishment. That's Bebo. Bush proudly proclaimed. And through intense marketing efforts, Everybody soon knew what Bebo was. Irving Berlin wrote the song, You Can't Stay Up on Bebo, for his musical Yip Yip Ya Hank, uh, the, the musical that God Bless in America first appears in. And there's a story that Bush paid him $10,000 to put that song in the musical. And also, if you listen to his prohibition song, The Near Future, you hear this line from Irving Berlin. Bebo, have a drink of Bebo though it hasn't a punch up his sleeve -o. Those who drink it insist that a Christian scientist could easily come staggering home on Bebo. <laughs> now pretty soon, by the early 1920s, Bush was actually making some uh, profit off Bebo. They were selling more cases at one point than they had of a Budweiser uh, before 1917, 10 cents a bottle, as you see. But even that failed to prevent him from losing money, and the rest of the breweries did too. And Bebo would eventually go by the wayside, remembered only by people who are so silly 
that they actually think that Bevo, the Longhorn mascot at the University of Texas, was named after that. Of course, that's utterly ridiculous, utterly. Silly. Bevo was named after the word bee, another word for cattle. That's why the Longhorn mascot is called Bevo. And I hope that you spread the word from this place throughout the country that Bevo, the mascot at UT, is not named after that. Yeah! Woo! Preach on! Yes. Back here in Somerville, uh, of course, prohibition would not change much of all. Uh, we were already dry, already dry in Somerville. So in the last months of World War I, what was on everyone's mind was the flu epidemic. Flu and influenza. That's right. Now, the flu epidemic struck Somerville in the middle of September 1918, and it killed 223 people in less than three weeks. All the schools were closed for days and days. Theaters were closed. Churches were closed. People were terrified. The flu would strike one member of the family within hours. Everybody in the household would be sick. The Board of Aldermen struggled to figure out how to meet this emergency. And the true heroes of the flu epidemic were the members of the Somerville Women's Clubs. And what they would do is they would find out if nobody was able to cook in the house. They'd go back and they'd make broth, hearty soups. They'd bring it over. They'd risk their lives going into the house wow. and making sure that people had something to eat. This at a time when some of the Somerville policemen were refusing to walk the regular beat because they were afraid of getting sick. <laughs> it was and truly an like awful fall. The U.S. Army was engaged in what is to this day the largest battle in the history of the U.S. Army, the Murs Argonne Offensive, a slow and brutal slog against well-entrenched defenders. But just as the casualty lists were going up, the flu epidemic ceased by the middle of October, and then, three weeks later, November 11th, it was official. Word arrived that the armistice had taken hold and the war in Europe was over. Somerville went delirious with joy. Church bells and whistles blew all over the city at 4 p.m. as the armistice officially began. Cars began driving around with tin pans tied to the rear fenders, horns blaring into the wee hours. The din was continuous, said the Somerville Journal. And there was a victory parade all the way from Davis Square to Union Square with stops at all the squares along the way. Teal, Ball, Magoon, Gilman, all the way to Union. And there was a similar parade, almost identical, the next day, Tuesday. What a wonderful day. But not everybody felt the same joy. Over on Moore Street in Teal Square, they lived the Garrier family. And they had two sons in the 104th Infantry in the Yankee Division. I'll be talking about the Yankee Division in my Veterans Day lecture at the Somerville Museum. And one of them, one of the sons, was named Elroy. And he was killed that September in the fighting of the Mers Argonne. And shortly before the armistice, Mrs. Garrier got a telegram from her other son, Arnold. It's actually a letter, not a telegram. And Arnold, in the letter, said, quote, he's the brother, Elroy was just as good over here as he was at home. Everybody in the company loved him. Dear mother, we must all be ready and willing to go. I hope, dear mother, that you will bear up and trust in the good God for strength to hear this sad news. And no sooner had Arnold's letter arrived that armistice day, but the Garriers learned by telegram that Arnold himself had died just a couple weeks earlier in the Murs Argonne. So what I propose to do now is invite all of you to raise your glasses in a toast. I'd like to toast the Garrier family, all the veterans of the First World War, the people of Somerville, and damnation of prohibition. Thank you.